All right, guys, we're now on the last video in this series on knee injury mechanics. So in the last particular video, we covered the uh, preventative strategies or the evidence behind preventative strategies, I should say, uh, behind ACL injury. We talked about some of the direct and indirect evidence. And to finish off this series of videos, I want to talk about risk factors. Now, a risk factor is basically any factor that's associated with increased risk or of a particular event. In this case, the event is obviously ACL injury. And these are particularly important to identify because if we find certain factors that are related to risk of injury, we can potentially modify them to reduce our risk of injury. Um, so obviously, therefore, these risk factors basically inform our interventions. Um, and if there are things that we can't change, then they're just some things that we can monitor. So as I talk about some of these risk factors that have been identified from the literature, I also want you to think about what of these factors can you actually change because there are some things that we can't change. Now, some of the most important risk factors that we've seen would be things like having a history of ACL injury. So if you have a history of ACL injury, you're more likely to tear your ACL than someone who has no history. Being a female uh, is also associated with greater risk of ACL injury. Um, age has also been associated with ACL injury and in particular, Different studies actually show different relationships, but generally speaking, being really, really young, so like under the age of 14, um, sort of that 14, even just sort of that puberty sort of region, uh, we tend to see sort of a spike in the incidence of, of ACL injury. Um, but there's potentially some interaction between um, age and sex as well. Um, so males and females, their incidence peaks at different ages as well. Um, so just important to know that age is an important factor, but it's, it's hard to know the exact relationship there. There's also some anatomical factors that are associated with ACL injury. Here I'm specifically talking about reduced notch width. So notch width is basically like the, the width of the notches within your actual knee. So that's really small. That seems to be associated with greater risk of ACL injury. Um, it's also a post, something called posterior tibial slope. So basically if your tibial slopes posteriorly more steeply, that would be associated with greater risk of ACL injury. Um, there's also genetic factors that are related to risk as well as things like knee laxity. So basically having a greater knee laxity is associated with greater risk of ACL injury. Um, there's also some factors related to strength. In particular, I'm talking about lower hip abduction strength and also lower knee flexor or hamstring strength. Um, there's a little asterisk next to these because as I've mentioned in a previous video, there's actually some conflicting evidence behind these. Um, Something like climate is also important. So there's actually some evidence that having a really high evaporation rate at the in the days leading up to a game can be associated with, with greater incidence of ACL injury. So we're not 100% clear on exactly how climate influences things, but there is some evidence to support that um, pretty much extreme climates tend to increase your risk of ACL injury. Um, level of play. So there's a, evidence that being at a collegiate level uh, is associated with greater risk compared to being at a high school level, which would suggest that higher levels of play have greater injury risk. There's also evidence behind the situation. So we tend to see more ACL injuries in games compared to training situations. Um, there's also things like body mass index. So basically having a higher weight tends to also be associated with greater risk of injury. Now, obviously there are some factors that we can change and some factors that we can't change. So we can't change your history of ACL injury because you can't go back in time. Um, if you're a female, well, I suppose technically you can change that, but the, the reasons behind why females are at greater risk of injury aren't fully understood, but they seem to be primarily related to biological factors. Um, so from a biological standpoint, you can't really change that a whole lot. Um, so we, we generally consider being female as an unmodifiable risk factor. Now, age, again, can't go back in time. You can't reverse aging. Anatomical factors don't really change as well because they're really skeletal. Genetics don't change. Something like knee laxity is potentially changeable. We don't necessarily know exactly how we might do that, but to some extent, that's probably changeable. To some extent, it's also related to genetics. Um, strength of certain muscles is obviously very modifiable. Climate is not something that we can actually change, but from a policy standpoint, we could potentially create policies that prevent us from playing under certain conditions where we might be at greater risk of injury. Level of play is something that most people wouldn't want to change. So most people would typically play at the highest level that they can. Um, situation, so game versus training, obviously in a sport, particularly at a high level, you've got to train, you've got to play games. But again, on a policy level, 
Maybe there might be a limit to how many games you can play in a certain amount of time. So maybe there is something you can do to change that. I don't know. Uh, body mass index, that's obviously you can change your body mass to some extent. So potentially that could be something that you could change as well. Now what's really important about risk factors before I move on is that risk factors are ideally determined from a prospective study. So what I mean by that is if you get a bunch of people, you measure a bunch of different factors that you think might be related to the injury, and then you just let them go on and live their life. So they might go on and play a particular sport or they might do whatever it is that they're doing. And then you just follow them up over time to see who gets injured and who doesn't. And basically what you can do is look at the factors that you've measured at the start of the study and see which factors are different between those that got injured and those that didn't get injured. Potentially those factors that are different might give you an indication of risk. So that's why you kind of need a prospective study because if you use a retrospective study, so this would be like recruiting a bunch of people that have never torn their ACL and then a bunch of people that have torn their ACL, you could do that and then measure a bunch of different things in them. But the problem is if you see a difference between them, you can't be sure if the difference was the cause of the injury or the result of the injury or both or neither. So that's why it's really important for risk factors to be derived from prospective studies. Now that being said, there are some risk factors that can be derived from retrospective studies with a reasonable amount of confidence. So here I'm talking about things like anatomic factors. So obviously something like having a reduced notch width or an increased posterior tibial slope, that's probably not something that's going to change because of an ACL injury. So measuring that after the injury in a retrospective sense probably isn't such a big deal. Same with things like genetics or um, sex-based differences um, or age or even something like climate. Obviously, these aren't things that change as a consequence of the injury. They're just things that, um, uh, you know, they're, they're likely to be persistent at least, um, at least for anatomical factors. For something like climate, obviously, you just got to look at what the climate was at the time of the injury. Um, so that's something else to think about. But for the most part, you really need perspective evidence behind that. Certainly for something like knee flexor strength, as an example, um, having lower hamstring strength, obviously hamstrings being one of your major knee flexors, having lower hamstring strength could conceivably increase your risk of injury based on a lot of the mechanisms that I've explained in the previous parts of these this video series. But as you guys also know, when you tear your ACL, they often have some sort of surgical intervention. And it's very common to take a graft site from one of your hamstring tendons that could and usually does weaken your hamstrings quite substantially. So if you assessed someone with a history of ACL injury, having lower knee flexor strength doesn't necessarily mean that being weaker was what caused the injury. They could have become weaker as a consequence of the injury. So looking at something like strength, the only way we could establish that as a risk factor is with a prospective study and not a retrospective study. So that's something that's really important to keep in mind because a lot of literature sources actually aren't quite that particular and they'll try and convey something as a risk factor even though there's no perspective evidence behind it. So just keep that in mind when you pour through the literature for ACL injury or any other injury. Ideally, you need a prospective study to establish a risk factor unless that particular factor pretty much cannot change as a consequence of the injury. So to sum up this video series, obviously, ACL injury, like many other injuries, is multifactorial. There's no one factor that leads to ACL injury, so we need to consider a lot of different things. Any interventions that we try to come up with to prevent ACL injury or any injury should ideally be informed by prospective evidence. But keep in mind, for something like ACL injury especially, these studies are very difficult to pull off because you need big numbers and lots of follow-up times. And it's also quite difficult to refine these studies because ACL injury interventions are often uh, very heterogeneous. They have a lot of different protocols or components of them. So it's hard to know which components are effective. And if we don't know which components are effective, it's hard to improve these interventions over time. Um, and obviously, hopefully you have an understanding of how we can use other forms of evidence. So this is non-prospective evidence to fill the gaps. So there's quite a bit of cross-sectional data that I've shown you things like in vivo, in vitro, and in silico evidence. And remember, in vivo means within a living, breathing human, in vitro within a cadaver, in silico just means simulation. Um, I've also explained that some retrospective data can actually be appropriate for things like 
uh, establishing anatomical factors as a risk factor. Um, and then hopefully you can see that biomechanical theory can also be justified. Because prospective studies are so difficult to pull off and it's difficult to refine these, sometimes biomechanical theory is the best that we have. And as long as there's conceivable benefits and there's no conceivable harm, um, sometimes this can be very well justified. But obviously, if you're making that recommendation, your justification needs to be very, very clear and well explained. So that's something else to keep in mind as well. And that's it. So hopefully you've learned something about knee injury mechanics. Obviously, I've focused a lot on ACL injuries in particular. But the basic concepts that we've learned here could be applied to any other injury. So for any injury that you might be interested in, um, ideally, you'd be looking for prospective evidence, direct evidence that shows particular interventions are effective. Um, you might also find some indirect evidence from different forms of um, you know, cross-sectional data or retrospective data. Um, and you may also try to come up with your own interventions by looking at the literature um, based on whatever the established risk factors are. You might identify some factors that could be modified with particular interventions.